morning. Why don't you stand and join us? Are we ready to worship our King today? Amen. Did we come expecting this morning for Him to move? And did we come ready to pour out our hearts and praise and worship to our King? Because He is so worthy and so due of all of our praise today. He says to come and offer. change the service order. If you were here last week, we kind of went just all over the place. It was great. A couple things this morning, just housekeeping items, and uh, we just want to say we love you every once in a while. It's just good to remind us of that, that you are loved. We are loved. Amen? Uh, one thing I want to do just at this point is I want to acknowledge um, James and Heather Gowers. you guys in here this morning? Looking around. They might not have made it in. Oh, there they are, right in the back. Just wave your hands again. Hey, we want to welcome them in the church membership this morning. Would you welcome me? Help me with that. Awesome. And then I have some pretty awesome people here this morning, too. Pete and Mary, where are you at this morning? Right down here. Pete and Mary Everingham. They're from Haver. 
And so we served in Haver for, man, almost seven years. And so we love them and they're visiting this morning. And so say hi to them and love on them a little bit this morning. Well, as we uh, enter into more worship this morning, I want to just do something we don't always do, but I want to give you just a quick little teaching, just a small teaching, and I mean it, okay? I'm not preaching right now. But I want to talk a little bit about the next song we're going to sing. It's called Come Thou Fount. How many of you know this song? Oh, how many of you love this song? I love this. This is one of my personal favorite songs, like not even just hymns, but songs. Like, I love this song. It's not uncommon for me to sing this one in the shower, okay? It's just, it's good. But I, I realize that it's one of those songs where it's like, sometimes we don't always know the language. We don't always know what the words mean. And so last time we sang this, a few people said, you know, pastor, it'd be good to know what that word means. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And so I just want to talk about a couple things. The song goes like this. It says, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart. If you're a musician, you understand what that means. Right? Make sure it's in unison. Make sure it's in the correct melody, the pitch. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. It doesn't end, amen? Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, which you can say it different ways, sonnet or sonnet, which is just, it's a beautiful song. It's just, it's a, nice melody sung by flaming tongues above how many of you know the angels sing in heaven and they're singing all the time they don't ever stop it says praise the mount we know what that is right it's a mountain I'm fixed upon it but it's not just any mountain it says mount of thy redeeming love we know about Mount Calvary right we know what happened on Golgotha we we know what Jesus did on the hill it says, Hel- here I raise my Ebenezer. You know what that is? It's not a call for Scrooge. Is that too soon? <laughs> you know how many times people ask us about Scrooge? I know. Poor Cindy. She feels call after call after call. I know. We never like it when things change, and I get it. But do you know what that word means? Ebenezer means thus far God has helped us. It's a biblical word. And it says, hither, which is just a fancy word of saying here. Here by thy help, I'm come. So it says, because I know that God is my help, thus far he's helped us, now I come. Knowing that God is going to do it again. It says, and I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Where's our home? Is it here? No, it's it's there. Jesus sought me when I was a stranger. Wandering from the fold of God. How many of you were wandering? I was wandering. We wandered from him. We're all like sheep who've gone astray. And it says, he, Jesus, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. He has interjected his blood into the story. And it says, oh, to grace, how great a debtor as someone who owe something, right? What do I owe my very life? To his grace. It says daily, because we die daily, right? We live daily. It says daily I'm constrained to be because of his grace. It says let thy goodness, like a fetter. What's a fetter? It's a shackle. Now see, in this life, you're either shackled by the wrong thing or the right thing. Paul says, I desire to be a slave of Christ. Right? Knowing that also when you're chained with that fetter, that you're, it's going to be real hard to go somewhere you shouldn't go when you're chained to something, right? If I'm chained to Christ, it means that it's going to be hard for me to just walk away from him. So we say, Lord, chain us to you. Bind my wandering heart to thee. How many of you are tired of wandering? Knowing the Lord and trying to walk away, and, and man, we were frustrated when that happens. But praise God that he says, oh, if you let me, I'll bind you to me. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. How many of you know that? Man, that's a glorious song. You agree with me on that one? Well, why don't we worship this morning? 
singing those words, not just singing them, but let them be a declaration. Amen? Amen. Sing your 
time church
nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You were the word at the beginning Yes Pray. 
desires your heart. I love what C.S. Lewis said about the Holy Spirit. He says that the Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven who chases us down until we're found. The Lord is going to chase you and chase you and chase you until you give him your whole heart. How many of you are thankful for that this morning? Jesus, we give you honor and praise today. Lord, we thank you that you don't give up. You are faithful and steadfast. You want our heart, Lord, and you want our home. So desire, we desire to give that to you today. Lord, I know you're taking us on a journey, Lord, and you're speaking to us and you're challenging us as a church, as a people of God, and even those who come into this place who aren't children of God yet. You're challenging us every single week to let you be Lord of our hearts. And you want to be Lord of our home. Lord, we know that there's a war going on for the home and for the heart. And so today, Lord Jesus, we just we yield to you. We yield to your spirit and what you want to do in us. We ask you to have your way in the service, Lord. We ask you to transform us by the renewing of our minds. Lord, we, we, we ask you, oh God, to not let this be principles or things that we hear from the, the word that we can apply to our lives today. Jesus, it's not just about that. It's about being changed by the ever-living God. So have your way in us, God. Break down the places where the enemy has shored up the wall in us. And let those walls fall today, we pray the preaching of the word. Jesus, we love you. We give you praise today. And his church said, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. Kids, you are dismissed to go to kids' church. Enjoy your time. Have fun. Grow in Jesus' name. Well, this morning, um, I have a manuscript here <clears throat> uh, that's sitting right around 6,000 words, which, for those of you who don't know, I wrote a book last year, and uh, that book was about 30,000 words. 
So you do the math and realize that this manuscript is almost a quarter of that. So uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot for us today. Um, I'm not going to read all that probably. Amen. Okay. Because we will be here till 4 o'clock. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff. And so I'm just really going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us this morning. And because uh, I know that although it is all truth, I really believe that we need to be transformed by what the Lord would have to say to us today. And uh, I give him permission to do what he wants. Well, as we start, I just want to very quickly just remind you of a couple things that are important. Um, we are coming up to the end of the year, and so make sure that you have your year-end year year end giving in by the 31st. I believe that's actually the 30th, so that it gets counted um, in the office there. And uh, so if you just help us with that. And then also, um, we are trying to streamline our deacon nomination process. And so if you would like to nominate someone for deacon, there is a pamphlet in your bulletin this morning. Fill that out and turn that in before the end of the year as well. And that would be very helpful. A couple other things I'm super excited about is um, Christmas season is upon us. Merry Christmas. Uh, it's great. I love this time of year. And uh, I know our staff has been teasing me because they thought I was a Scrooge until December 1st. And then my Christmas sweaters have come out, and it's been quite fun around the office. I says, I'm just a season guy, man. I just enjoy the seasons. And once one season's over, I'm into the next, and, and it's just good. But with that, um, we have something coming up that's called Family Christmas. It's our Christmas Eve celebration, and so it's going to be something very unique and just something we've never done before. Um, and we have been putting hours and hours into this. And here's one thing I can guarantee you, that you're going to leave with being very impacted by what the Lord is doing. And um, it's one of those things that if you miss it, you're going to be the guy who missed it. And everyone else is going to say, hey, did you hear what happened? Did you see what happened? I mean, were you there? And you're going to be like, no, you're going to be that guy. Okay, don't be that guy. Okay, so I encourage you to be there. You're not going to want to miss it. Four o'clock on Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day, we have a breakfast at nine and PJs all day. Um, for those who would like to do that, if you don't want to wear PJs, I get it. Be modest, okay, in your PJ wearing. If you said, I just can't bring myself to do it, Pastor, it's all right. There is no judgment here. There is no ostracizing. But we also ask you don't ostracize the pajama wearers, okay? It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be us doing Christmas together. It's going to be great. Well, as we jump into the Word this morning, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. And so go ahead and turn there with me if you would. We're encouraging you to bring your Bible. If you don't have one, get a hold of us. We can help remedy that situation. We will have some of it on the screen this morning as well. As we jump into things this morning, there is a lot, like I said earlier, there is a lot of material for us to go through. We are basically talking about the home. Last week we talked about how the Lord wants to be Lord of us. He wants our heart. But he also wants to be Lord of every relationship that we have. It's not just about us. It's about the person next to us. It's about the people that are entrusted to us. And so as Paul unpacks that, um, there's a, several things I want to just um, let you know right off the bat just to frame our conversation this morning. And I want you to know this, that there's really, you know, in the church, there's been this understanding that there's secular and sacred. When you're a disciple, that's not language that should be regularly on our tongue. Because how many of you know that when the Lord takes hold of you, everything we put our hands to should be sacred? You know, in the church life, we, we, we think of, well, whatever I do in this building, or, or whatever I do on Wednesday nights, or, or whatever I do in these certain situations, this is sacred, but all this stuff, this is secular, and this is different. And so we, we segregate, and we have this dichotomy of sorts, where we have this going on over here, and we have this going on over here, but they don't interact. There's no understanding of that concept in the scripture at all. Paul never operated under that premise. He always operated under the premise that the gospel would infiltrate everything that we do and everything that we say and everything that we look at. It would be the very lens in which we operate our lives in. There is nothing that stands outside of God's control. There's no final distinction between sacred and secular. A life ruled from above where Christ is seated. 
is a life in marriage, parenthood, everyday life, every relationship, everything we touch. In some ways, you can almost argue that it's the Midas effect. Although, turning things to gold doesn't necessarily happen, does it? But how many of you know that in our mindset, everything we touch should have the question of, Lord, what will you do with what I've touched? What is your plan for what it is that I've touched? And as we go through Paul's letter here, we see that he's talked about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and all the changes and the intersecting of the gospel with our lives. He says, put your perspective on things above where Christ is seated, not on earthly things. And then he begins to turn the corner as he's talking about, so get rid of all these nasty things and, and make, remember that your identity isn't in those things. Remember your identity is in Christ. So therefore, all these things, you should do all these things. We talked about that last week. Be compassionate and kind. That's great to say that. But here's a question I have, and this is one that challenges me. Even if I, as I prepared this and looked at over this this last week, I've been personally challenged with, if my faith was boiled down to who I am in my home, am I following Jesus? How many of you would be challenged with that? I know I'm challenged with that. If people were to walk into my home and see everything that I do in my home, would they say, oh, this man loves Jesus? We think that there's a, this difference between outside my home and inside my home, sacred and secular. I know growing up in my home, I came from a home that was pretty broken at times. When I came to know the Lord at a young age and started going to church, eventually my family started coming to the church. But, you know, it, it wasn't what you thought because as my family started coming to church and they started having an interaction with Jesus and the gospel and who, who Christ is and all these different things, things began to shift in the home, but here's the struggle. Is that there were so many ways that my family, my parents had been taught that they, they wrestled with one another quite often. I would often tell my friends in the church, I said, you know, honestly, being at home is like being in hell and being in church is like being in heaven. Because one didn't reflect the other. It wasn't uncommon to go to services or go Wednesday night and then come home and see my, my parents having a knockdown, drag out conversation that doesn't always end well. They wrestled with this idea of how could Jesus change our home? It's almost like when we walked in our home, there was a barrier in which Jesus had no influence. Growing up in that lifestyle, I know they each tried to do it, but to be honest, they, they tried to do it in their own strength, and we, we watched the struggle for years and years until eventually the home fell apart. So then when I, get, when I got married, Christy and I, we both come from homes that have been divorced. Right? We've had, we have all these different relationships and whatnot, so Christy and I came together, and how many of you know that that, that causes a lot of conversation? Like you're trying to figure out how to be married to this person. You're trying to do it God's way when you haven't seen God's way. And so then you're like, well, God, what is it that it should look like? I grew up in a military home. My dad was in the service. And I'll tell you, um, my understanding of how a marriage and a, how parenting relationship should be it was a certain way. And it involved a lot of yes, sir, no, sir. A lot of authoritarian ways of doing things. How many of you ever, ever grew up in a home with an authoritarian? It's like, you did it just because they said so. Right? And there was nothing else ever involved in that. And so you grew up knowing the, the importance of, well, if they said it, I must do it. Because at the very you know, top of the list, obedience is all that they desired. And so then when you start parenting, you start being in a relationship with someone, and you, you get married to that person, and, and all of a sudden... Everything that you do in marriage and with the children revolves around that. You default to that which you know, right? I tell you what, this has been a journey for your pastor, trying to learn how to be a parent, realizing that maybe the authoritarian way of doing things isn't actually as scriptural as we think. The value isn't just by 
doing what I've said. It's interesting, and I'm off my notes now, which don't worry, I'm going to let the Lord lead me through my notes, so I'm not going to have to read all this too. But here's what I'll say, is that the authoritarian way of looking at life has trickled down in the church to an authoritarian way of looking at Scripture. So for instance, when I say, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. What's most important? Love. If you love me. Don't worry, that's usually where I went too. It's like, well, Jesus, I love you, so therefore I gotta go obey you. That wasn't Jesus' point. His point was, is if you love me, the effect of that will be that you will do everything I've asked you to because you love me so. But even in the church, how many of us have grown up with that? Like, well, hey, if you love me, you'll obey me. And so then we put all the emphasis on obedience while missing the whole point. Listen to what Paul says, Colossians 3. He says, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Does that mean we parent in the name of the Lord Jesus? Does that mean we have a marriage relationship in the name of the Lord Jesus? Everything, right? Giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then he goes on, he says, wives, Submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Which, by the way, that's the only place in the scriptures where that term is used. The Lord Christ. It's kind of interesting. It says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Masters, Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. The key issue in this whole, this whole part of Scripture and the question that Paul is really answering is where does true authority lie? We try to answer this question when we say things like, do that. And the child says, why? And you say, and we think that'll be enough. To say, because I said so. It's a very bleak moment when you realize the level of your authority is somewhere down here. Right? Because when you realize that's this not good enough for that child, you realize, hmm, Somehow in this authority bank, I have very little credibility. How many of you have ever been there? You're like, okay. You're like, what now? Okay. Paul uses the Greek word karios, which means lord or master. He uses this very intentionally. Paul is trying to help us understand that if Christ is who he says he is, and he has done what he says he's done, then that means that he truly is Lord of everything. Here's what I want you to know this morning. Jesus desires to rule every heart and every house. Everything, every relationship we have has little to do with the person in front of us and has everything to do with the person always before us. What I mean by that is it has very little to do with your neighbor and has much more to do with the Lord.
So let's look at a few of these this morning. So if you're taking notes, if you're one of these categories, I want to encourage you this morning. This is going to be a little bit different. You're going to have a lot more teaching today. Um, but I would encourage you to take notes. And here's what I'd also encourage you to do. Take notes of the things that don't apply to you. Because here's what we do sometimes in the church. We'll take something that's said to not us, and we'll throw it off and say, well, I don't need that. Here's what you might not realize, is that you might need it soon. Or, better yet, someone else might need it that you can encourage. I love to see us as a church not just become people who are saying, oh, well, what about me? But recognizing that one of your primary responsibilities is to take the word and trust it to you and share it with others. Right? You're going to have an opportunity to, to honor and to encourage and to lift up the ones around you. Listen, there's far too many marriages that are failing in the life of the church today. The divorce rate in the church and outside of the church is almost the same. Which tells us something. We're struggling, aren't we? And we need more community. We need the word to encourage us. And we need to be pro more proactive as a church to say, hey, how can I come alongside the people around us? So let's talk about marriage just for a moment. And this is just a nice little plug, a nice little place to stop and say that in your bulletin this morning, you have an insert for something called the heart and soul of real marriage from Bridge to Life Ministries. This is an exciting thing. This is being covered by one of our members to bring these people in from Michigan to do a training for people who are married or who are engaged, who are going to be married this is an encouragement to bring them in to say, hey, we want healthy marriages, right? This is primarily to see us develop a ministry within the church of the body to the body, where people who are being trained on how to really encourage people in crisis in marriage, come alongside people in marriage, to give them the tools necessary to help them walk with someone who's going through it. How many of you have ever gone through it before and said, man, I wish I had somebody to walk with me? We're kind of being honest this morning. I know I've been there where we've needed someone to walk with us. Because sometimes we assume everybody knows what to do or how to walk in times of struggle. And so if you're interested in that, I encourage you to fill that out. Send it in. Put it in the offering. You can drop it off at the hubs, and we'll make sure that you get connected. This is going to be happening February 16th through the 18th, and this is going to be a great time for us to train people on how to grow in their marriage. This is going to be benefit to, to just, I mean, if, even if that's all you do is you go to the training, you're trained and it's great, that's going to benefit you, okay, you and your marriage. But then also to see it benefit others around you and see what God will do with this. And so we need to have at least 10 couples who are willing to do this for this, this group to come and do it. So I think we can do that. And so just, that's just a plug. Well, let's talk about wives for a minute because you're first on the list, wives. So if you're a wife in here, would you raise your hand just so we know that we're not just preaching to a crowd? Okay. We have lots of wives in here this morning. Paul begins with the wives. And I'll just be honest, of course in our culture, in our time, this is a hot button topic. Right? I don't even think I need to go far in that. You all know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of wokeism that's gotten involved in this. And every time we don't like something, that's what we do. We just say we don't like it and we desire to change it because we don't like to do anything hard. That's just how sometimes we are. Paul says that the wives are called to submit to their husbands. The middle voice here suggests something more like submit yourselves, which has a little bit of a different flair to it, doesn't it? Submit yourselves. So this isn't an instruction or a harsh order intended to bring some sort of cringing subjugation. This isn't something that's meant to be a dominance call. It is a call to make a deliberate decision, to choose to act in a certain way. So let me just say this. Husbands, if you're using this to, to get your wife to do what you want them to do, you're not using this correctly.
the rationale for this choice is not even that the wife loves her husband or that she even likes her husband. Because some of you, I don't know where you're at in this, okay? This has zero to do with the husband. Amen. Yes. This has zero to do with the husband. This has everything to do with Christ. See, you could almost say it this way. Wives, submit to Christ. And therefore, submit to your husband. Now, I know we don't always teach this. The primary reason for the wife to choose to respond positively to this imperative command of Paul to submit is not her husband's will, but the relationship that she has to Christ. It's interesting, the same verb that's applied to this statement about wives submit to your husbands is the same one that Paul also uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, when he says, when all things are subjected to him, which is Christ, and that word subjected is the same word. In the Greek, that is the same word. It says, when all things are subjected, submitted to him, then the Son himself will also be submitted to him, God, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and in all. So if submission of the wives was meant to be a demeaning thing, Christ would have been demeaned in what Paul said. But how many of you know Christ isn't demeaned in any way? He's exalted. Interesting. While there are many discussions and commentaries, there's lots of thoughts on this regarding the various social factors that may have influenced Paul's writing during this time and his view of male and female relationships, they all agree that the fundamental reason for this view is Christological, means that it focuses on who Christ is and has very little to do with the relationships of society. Because how many of you know that Jesus doesn't change? This isn't a command that was limited to Paul's day, which is obvious for two reasons. Number one, the order of creation. He talks about how man was created first, then woman in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. And then secondly, the order within the Godhead. Christ submits to the Father in those things. 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. So submission and subordination does not mean inferiority. It simply means that the husband, not the wife, is the head of the home. You can even think of it as a president and vice president situation. Now, I don't encourage you using those languages in your home. You know, madam vice president and things like that. I don't encourage that. But Of course, we have to remember that there are moral limits to this submission. See, because if we submit to Christ, then we know we submit always. Because he doesn't change and he doesn't give us any unbiblical reason not to. To submit to him. However, in our submission to Christ, we recognize that those people underneath us don't always lead the way that they're supposed to. Within the church, we know that pastors don't always lead the way that they should, according to what the word says. Did you realize that there's a time in which we're not supposed to honor the authority above us in a way of obedience? We're always respectful. And we follow Christ as he's called us to follow him. But there's going to be times in our lives when you probably have met people like that in authority that didn't lead the way they're supposed to. We should love and respect those people, pray for those people. But there are times when we have to look at the relationship and, and how the husband is leading and recognize that they're not leading according to how Christ would want them to lead. Now, what that doesn't mean, wives, is that that's a chance for you to overthrow the government. It's not a chance for you to overthrow the home. If anything, what it is, is it's a call for you to love them and gently show them the way. But it's not for you to usurp the authority. See, that's what happened in my home growing up. And it didn't work out very well.
The wives are free and responsible agents, and they're voluntarily asked to submit themselves to their husbands in the Lord. This shows that the wife's calling is to love and respect her husband. It's not an absolute surrender of her will. Wives, you're not called to be robots. For Christ is her absolute authority, not her husband. You don't submit to your husband because he does everything right. You submit to your husband because you love Jesus. I will say this. um, This isn't a call. Sometimes this happens in churches. This isn't a call for wives to submit to men. I would not advise you men to try to have wives submit to you in the course of church life. Just because they're a female doesn't mean that they should submit to you. We submit one to another. In Ephesians, it tells us that. Submit yourselves then one to another. All of us are called to submit to one another out of love. But just, I would encourage you, be careful with that. You say, well, pastor, what do you mean by that? Sometimes, the well-meaning people will say, well, I'm, I'm a man, so therefore, this person's wife needs to do what I've asked them to do in the, in the confines of the church and ministry. Be very careful. Well, and I would not want to see the husband's face when you just... Try that. (laughs) It just wouldn't be good, I don't think. That would not breed unity in the body. Okay? That's what I'm trying to say. All right. You taking notes this morning? This isn't uh, always the funnest message because we're like, man, why are we just talking about husbands and wives? And I get that. I get that. But here's what we need to remember, is that as the home goes, so the church goes. Sometimes I think there's unhealthy churches because there's unhealthy homes. And as we transition into talking about the husbands, here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. Husbands, you're called to pastor your home. You're called to pastor your home. One last thing about wives, and I'll move on to husbands. The purpose of wife's submission is not to give her husband control, but to give Christ control. Because he desires to rule your hearts, wives, and therefore also rule the home in which you're in. Let's talk about husbands for just a moment. Now, knowing that husbands feel most loved when they're most respected, true? True? Where are the guys in the room? Raise your hand if you're a husband in the room. Do you feel most loved when you're most respected? Oh, you're being quiet. This is your chance. You're just saying, this is your chance. You don't get it that often. Here it is. Respond. There you go. Well, here's what I'll say is that no wife would likely be in a place of objection to submitting to a husband who truly loves her. Here's what I have found out, and I I share this story kind of tongue-in-cheek, so just know your pastor's heart on this. If my wife was here, she would verify this, but when we first got together, some of you have heard this story. When we first got together, I uh, one day just kind of thought it would be, I don't know what I thought, but in a moment, I said um, to her, we were doing something, and I was trying to get her attention. I said, woman, and she said to me, Man, and it's been that way ever since, <laughs> which is kind of funny because obviously man and woman, you know, God d- designed that. But, and I always tease her. I say, well, you know, Jesus said woman on the cross to his mother, talking to John and saying, John, you take care of her and, you know, whatever. And he always said it in such an endearing way, so it wasn't a demeaning term, but of course I said it in a different way, and I understand that, okay? <sighs> but it's funny, now it's kind of this running joke Where it's like, you know, this is, now it's a term of endearment for one another. It's like, woman? She's like, man? And it's just like this reminder 
of our, our role. Um, but here's what I'll tell you is that you're not going to gain points bossing your wife around. If there's anything, I think you'll find that there's a resolute steadfastness within the woman that you didn't know until you did that, <laughs> at least in most of them. And so I hear men say all the time, well, I don't know how, how to, to teach my wife how to submit to me. I'm like, well, here's what you need to do. This is very important. Pray a lot for her and for you. And pray that you would love your wife. Isn't it amazing that the prayer that you must pray isn't that she'd submit to you, but that you would love her? Because there's an, a beautiful thing that God has put in all of our marriages is that when you as a husband lead, <laughs> when you lead by showing love to your wife, a miraculous thing begins to take place. She submits to you because her heart can't not do it. Because when the woman is cherished in that way, recognize, because one of the most beautiful things men you can do for your, your, your wife is to lead. And not just lead in a way of strongness and just, you know, bull-headed strength. But when you lead in compassion and when you follow Jesus with a resoluteness, that understands that the man God's calling you to be is one of compassion and mercy and quiet strength and love for everyone else. The kind of love that lays down all your rights and all your desires and all your wants for someone else. When that happens, everyone around you is affected. Everyone. And it begins with the one that's closest to you. It is a joy to submit to someone who loves you. Like, I even see that even in our office. I know that I'm not married to any of these staff members, right? Praise the Lord. That was not a very good joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologize. Don't write me a letter. <clears throat> but here's what I'll tell you. I've worked in different places, and I've watched team members in different places don't always get along. And then it's a struggle. It's a struggle to do anything together. It's a struggle for you to, to get things done. It's a struggle because you feel like there's a lack of trust in certain places. Like it, it affects everything. But you want to know what I found? Is that when you recognize the people you work with love you, it's amazing how much you're willing to, to do for them because you love them and they love you. So husbands, love your wives as is fitting to the Lord. Don't be harsh with them. Wives, see, you're, you're like tender, sensitive flowers. And us men are very great gardeners. Not usually. So be patient with us. Because sometimes flowers start to wilt. And flowers wilt under authoritarian heavy hands. If you've ever gardened, which I've begun doing that with my wife, it's a lot better to be gentle. You know, I try to get a lot of things done. I'm a task-oriented person. How many of you are like that? You're with me. Like, just get it done, right? Um, that's hard to do with gardening. Just get it done. Stick that thing in the ground and you just, you know, you plant it in there. And my wife had to tell me one day, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of flowers. That was my goal. And she says, honey, it doesn't matter how many you plant if they don't live. <laughs> yeah? That's a whole different mindset, see? I was like, hmm. I was like, you're on your own. Just plant them in there and be like, hope you live. Um, sometimes that's what we do in our marriages. It's like, come on, just stick it in there. Like, oh, I did it. Check it off the list. All right, move on. Husbands, gentle. Take time. Put it in the ground with gentleness. Tend to it. I'm just letting that percolate for a minute. 
A maturing marriage involves a husband exercising compassionate care and his wife responding with willing, loving submission. You know, there's this old adage, happy wife, happy life. You ever heard that? That's a good one. Paul says in Ephesians 5.25, which is a parallel letter to this. He's writing it at the same time. He says, husbands, love your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Our duty is to love our wives. In a sacrificial way. Christ-like, sacrificial leadership by the husband will always keep the ultimate good of his wife in view. Husbands, you need Christ to rule your heart. And you need Christ to rule his house. You need him to rule your house. It's important. All right, this morning, let's move on to uh, children and, and, um, and parents. How many of you love your kids? I'm just asking a real question, you know. Do you love them? Like, really? It's interesting. Paul doesn't use the same word when he's talking about children and wives. He actually talks, he uses the word obedience. That's a much stronger word. He didn't use obedience for wives. And he didn't use submission or submit for children. There's probably a reason for that. Can you imagine a home that was like that? Trying to get your wife to obey you while you're a child. You're like, oh yeah, okay, if you'd like to. If you'd like to submit, that'd be great. How many of you have children that would totally submit? It's like, oh, this is optional? You mean I get to choose if I want to submit? It would be a messed up place. Sometimes we live that way, though. Parents, you need to parent your children. I didn't expect it all right there, but that's good. You need to parent your children. Okay, don't let society do it. If you're doing that, you're part of the problem. Okay, okay. Parents your children. It's a responsibility. God has given you that responsibility. He expects you to do it. If you don't know how to do that, ask for help. Because if you don't ask for help, someone's liable to give it to you. And someone you don't want to have help from. You don't want to be (laughs) given encouragement on how to parent from people who aren't doing it very well. But if it gets to the point where people have to tell you to parent your children, uh, We need to honor the Lord in parenting our children. Children are encouraged to obey their parents. We have any kids in here today? I'll let you have a chance. Raise your hands, kids. Oh, there's a few of you. There's some youth kids in here. All right. All right. This is your favorite sermon ever. Don't write me any letters, okay? Just saying. It is right, Paul says. It is right to obey the Lord. See, because here's the thing. Your parents are not perfect. Okay, I'll just speak to you guys. They're not perfect. Um, I don't even have to step in your home and, and, and kind of do a study or anything to realize that they are not perfect. Some are figuring it out maybe a little better than others, but they're not perfect. Give them grace. Just because your parents aren't perfect, just because they fail, doesn't give you the right to not obey them. But why? Why do you have to do what your parents say? Why? Because this pleases the Lord. You know, you've always asked for us to give you a real reason. But why? Because I told you so. That's never really a good reason for you, and I get that. I totally understand that. So let me give you a better reason. Because by doing so, 
you please God. Now that's interesting. Because what does the writer of Hebrews tells us pleases God? Faith. It's impossible to please God without what? Faith. So then Paul turns around and says, Obey the Lord by obeying your parents. If you obey your parents, this pleases the Lord. This is so important. It's almost the same language in which we see when Abram, Abraham, when he follows God, and it says that his faith was credited to him as righteousness. So listen to me, kiddos, teenagers, almost adults. When you obey your parents, it is so pleasing to the Lord, it's almost the same idea as Abraham choosing to honor God by going to a place he has never seen. The father of faith and children obeying their parents is the same pleasingness to God. So children, when you obey your parents, to the Lord it feels just as if Abraham is following his command. So I would say, be like Abraham, huh? Obey the Lord, because it pleases him. It puts us in the same place as the people of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. It's a beautiful thing. It's interesting when we talk about children and the importance of children obeying their parents. I will say this. um, There is a a healthy disconnect. I've seen a lot of parents who try to parent their children well into their adult years. Stop it. Just stop it. That is not what the Bible teaches. I know that might hit really hard. But if your your child is 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, they're not a child anymore. The Bible says that they need to move on, be respectable adults. Now, should they honor and love you? Yes, they should honor and love you as people who've reared them. Yes, it's biblical to do that. It's biblical for them to treat you with everything that Christ has told them to do that. All through Scripture, it tells us all the qualities, how we should treat people. Yes, they should continue to do that. But the Bible also says that they are to leave their father and mother and cleave to their wife. It's good for children to grow up and move on in a way that they can honor the Lord and honor you in the process. But it is not good for you to keep your parentalness over top of them the whole way through. If you're doing that, that's very unhealthy and that is not biblical. Okay, so be very careful with how you parent your children in this. We, we should say, though, just remember, to the, the, the child, who, no matter how old you are, you should not do anything that would be contrary to the teachings of Jesus. You still with me this morning? I don't preach like this very often, but there's a lot of things I think Paul wants us to know. And sometimes when we grow, church, We have to grow small. Little bit by little bit. Today's message is what we would call a mustard seed in our life. It looks so small and insignificant. But if that seed is watered, If you take this and you begin watering this, looking at how Paul is encouraging the home to operate, and he says, listen, everything you do, everything you do flows out of who Christ is and what he's done. And if we begin to water that, 
what will happen is that we'll find that this mustard seed grows into one of the largest trees the world has ever seen. It's so strong. It's never blown over. And we need families that aren't blown over. Come on, somebody. Paul goes on to talk about fathers. I'm going to talk about parents because the, way I, the reason I know I can do that is because in that time frame, fathers weren't usually the disciplinarians. They weren't usually the ones in the home with the, with the children. Paul specifically, have you ever wondered why he says fathers and not mothers? Well, to be honest with you, because the mothers were already in the home doing this. But Paul, he addresses this to the highest authority in the home that was typically absent. He says, fathers. Fathers. So we know that Paul is telling us that as parents, we need to make sure that we don't exasperate, that we don't embitter our children. Can I just be, I'll just be transparent with you, church. This is something I've wrestled with. Because growing out of the authoritarianist home mindset, I was the child who was yes sir, no sir. Like I learned the value of obedience. But can I be honest? I didn't learn the value of love. And obedience only takes you so far. You know, there's a phrase that I've learned in the, several, in the last you know, several years is that rules without, rebel, without relationship lead to rebellion. Rules without relationship will breed rebellion. So sometimes when we focus all of our energy and our attention on obedience with our kids, and then when we're shocked because they go, they go a whole different weird way, that you're like, I didn't see that coming. Because here's what happens. When we teach our children to obey for obey, obedience sake, here's what we teach them. To suppress all of their struggles. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what questions you've got. None of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters is whether you look right, whether you behave correctly. And that's still something within the church life we're, we're unpacking. We're trying to undo some of these things. Because we realize that kids that behave perfectly doesn't mean that their inward life has been re regenerated by Christ. Just because they do the right things doesn't mean that their heart is right. And then eventually you can only suppress it for so long before the real that's inside comes out. Now, is your pastor saying that there should be no conversation about obedience and there should be? No, I'm not saying that at all. But it's so important the attitude and the mindset we use in which we teach obedience. For instance, and actually, Pastor Weston, you're great at this. You're, you're, you're amazing. I love that. Amen. They don't even know what I'm going to say about you. And they're amening. I love it. I've watched him do this especially when we first got here and he was really spending a lot of time with the kids here at, at Central, is that I, I watched how many times like, the kids would be doing something that was not something we wanted, any of us wanted them to be doing. But the way that Pastor Weston talked to those kids, I was like, man, like, I would have done that totally different. And I like his way better. I'm just saying that right from the pulpit. You just need to know that. Because like, the way he would talk to them is say, hey, 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 bud, like I, like, I really love you, and you need to know that. And so I'm thinking that maybe we should reconsider what we're doing right now. Because this, maybe running around right over in this one spot, that's not going to be helpful. That's not going to love the people around us. Like, do you think we should do something that's more loving? Maybe go over here and do that over here? Like, he had this conversation with them, and I'm, like, listening to him. I'm, like, you're telling them not to run around in the church. But it was the way he was telling them. Where he's like, he's getting on their eye level and he's having a conversation with them saying, hey, you need to know I love you and this isn't probably going to be the best way to do this. Can I show you a better way to do this? And pretty soon I'm watching him do that with the kids and I'm like, this man's a genius. Because I grew up in a home where it's like, stop that. 
And I'm like, but why? Right? And in that moment, I just, I felt crushed rather than encouraged that I could be a part of the solution and that he loved me. That's an important thing. There's a way to do that. So I would encourage us. I know we have a lot of kiddos around here. How many of you have ever... Have you, how many of you have seen them out in the lobby? Oh, boy. There's a tension we have to manage, right? And parents, I encourage you to help us with that. The first responsibility to have a conversation like Pastor Weston was talking about, about saying, hey, if there's a, a better way to do this, like, let's not do that, let's do it this way. That responsibility falls on you as a parent. Now we realize there's gonna be fun and they're gonna run around at times and we understand that. There needs to be attention. Fun, but also being able to love other people because it's not loving when you run through somebody and put them in the hospital. That's not loving. Okay, we don't want any of those things happening. So my encouragement, parents, you need to be the first one to say something. As a body, as a church body, we reserve the right to say something. Gently. Lovingly. But how many of you know that sometimes your kid's going to do something somewhere where you're not around? That never happens. There's been a few times I'm going to have to say, hey, Johnny. If your kid's name's Johnny, I'm not picking on you. I'm just, you know, different name, hopefully. But Johnny, don't slap your brother in the face. That's not loving, right? That's not going to cause him to love you more. (laughs) Just saying. That's okay, but parents, you're the primary person on this. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. How we as parents correct our children, teach them obedience, is going to be a reflection of how they see God. We have a responsibility to love them let them know that we love them more than what they're doing. However, we know that we love them too much to let them keep doing what they're doing. There's guidance that needs to happen on that. All right. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up this morning. Just in case you're wondering, I'm on page 10 out of 17. So... I'm not going to go through all this this morning. Here's what I'll say. I think in the church life, sometimes we're so caught up in the emotional. Let's be honest. I, most, most Sundays, I, I'm a ball of fire up here. And I get that. Okay? We're not used to just having a conversation. Very little craziness. Because sometimes I just can't contain myself. And I get that. But I've been in this ministry thing long enough to realize that there are some Sundays where the Lord almost resets us and reminds us that it's not about the emotion. It's not about what you feel. It's not about the expectation that you have. It's not about what a good service feels like. Sometimes simply what we need to do is read the scripture. Be challenged with a simple understanding and make a decision if we're going to let Jesus have his way in that area of our life we just read about or not. And so, this morning what my challenge is is just where we started with. We have lots of things that we've shared about, lots of different things that have impacted us or hit us at different times, and maybe that the Lord is speaking to us about. But at the very core of it, 
is that Christ wants to be Lord of your heart and your home. And I know that there's things in my own life, because your pastor is not perfect, that in my own home, I'm like, Lord, you know, this is something I, I'm, I'm wrestling with and I need, to, I need to work through. One of the things, I'm, I'm just being open with you. One of the things I've, I pray often about is, Lord, I want to parent not like my dad did. The only way that can happen is, a, is if Jesus has his way. The only way that that can happen is if I let Christ reshape and reform my view of how this has to be. And every time I fail, because how many of you know we fail? It's like, man, I didn't want to do it that way. Every time we fail, we say, Lord, I don't want to do it that way. I recognize that's not the way you want me to do it, and I, I know I want to do it this way. And so, Lord, I know I need to, I need to make some, have some repentance, and I know I need to acknowledge that with this person. I, there's often times I have to go in my son's room and say, you know, I don't think I handled that probably the best way. I'm sorry. I, so let's do that again. And it's frustrating when I have to do that, but how many of you know the fact that we're doing that? Yes. At least I'm recognizing it enough now to say, okay, Lord, that's not how you want me to do that. And I'll say that it doesn't matter what relationship we're in, whether it be a marriage relationship or a parental relationship or a whatever relationship. Because we know that whatever human relationship we're in, the true object of service and the true focus of all of our love and obedience is on Christ. Which means that that affects everything else. You say, well, I'm not married. I don't have kids. Okay, but you might someday. You might be married someday. And even if you're not, you can apply every single thing to the relationships you have around you. you say, man, what am I doing with my family? Like, what, how am I living my life with the people I work with? Like, how am I going to, do they see Christ in me? The Lord wants to rule your heart and your home. Will you let him? I'm gonna encourage you, if you would take out your response card this morning, it's in the bulletin, and fill out your name on one side, and then on the back, I just have some questions I want you to work through with me. Go ahead and pull it out. I'm gonna give you a minute. I'm not gonna just reference it and move on. This is how we're gonna end this morning, I think. And I'm just going to challenge you. If you, if you say that you, you, do, you don't really reflect Christ in your home, or maybe there's parts of your relationships you just don't, obviously that's a place where Jesus wants to do something. I want you just to take a moment. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to, I'm going to have you just fill that out. Because I think today's a little bit more of that just, Jesus, what do you want to do in me? So Father, I just pray for this church that is yours. It doesn't belong to anybody but you. Jesus, we know that you want our heart. You want us. But Lord, we also know that you desire to have our home. You desire to have this house. and everyone who lives in them. You desire us to live lives, God, that submit to you and your will. 
not just because it sounds right or it sounds good, but because we love you, Jesus. And we're grateful for what you've done in our lives and the saving that you've done. And so, Jesus, we just ask today that you would do a work in us. We know that the, the root for change in our home is us. You want to do a work in us and thereby affect our home. Because we know that we need more loving husbands. We need, we need submitted wives. We, we, we need children who obey. We, we need to be a home, God, that honors you in every way. That we want to do everything as pleasing to the Lord. Lord, that we would not be able to lord over one another, God, but that we would be able to love you and honor you in every way. So Jesus, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us. Lead us right now. Challenge our thoughts. Reframe our thinking. Convict our soul, God, of the things in our home that need to change, that you want to work in, that you want to change. Lord, and we invite you to do that in us today. Help us take a step in that direction. Because you want to grow in us, even if it's growing small. In fact, that's how you grow in us. Small. Just like the mustard seed. So Jesus, grow in us. So every heart and home will serve you. And love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you just take a moment and fill this out. The worship team is going to sing a song here in just a moment. But I just want to give you a chance to fill this out this morning. In fact, I'll do it with you. finish, you can follow these guys' lead and throw them in the boxes up front here or at the hubs when you leave today. finish feel free to stand we're gonna we're gonna sing a song I, I give you my heart which I think is fitting for today and we just give him your heart and your home today and ask him to do a work in Jesus name thank you Lord go ahead worship team this is my desire
Central. Thanks for being here today. Merry Christmas to you. You are dismissed. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you back here next week.